studied at Woods Hole Biological Laboratory. She's been awarded two research fellowships, one there and one at the Cary Institute in New York. And so she's right. So thank you very much for coming, Lori. Well, let me just go over here. I am so glad you're all here today. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the magnificent monarchs. Let me, but first though, before I delve into this, introduce my partner in crime and chief assistant, <laughs> Regina Marie Coonrod, AKA Westie, or Wicked Evil Stepdaughter. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she helped me to, uh, to find, gather, scavenge, um, all the little creatures that you will see today. So, and she's also going to help me by doing this live. Okay, so the mystery of the monarchs. We're going to be talking about who they are. Sorry. What the heck is so interesting about them? Are we all good? Mm. Can you see? Okay. What's so interesting about them? Where do they live? When do they migrate? Why do they migrate? And how do they do it? Okay, so first, who are they? They are known as Deneus plexippus. It's their scientific name. Obviously, they're widely recognized. There would probably be only a handful of people who, if they saw a monarch, couldn't say, oh yeah, that's a monarch. I mean, that's just one of those butterflies. It's very charismatic. It's really, really recognizable, and it's obviously quite beautiful. Um, interestingly, they are really bad tasting, <laughs> and they're poisonous to most of the things that want to eat them, which is really good for them. <laughs> what else is interesting? Their food needs, what they eat at various times in their lives. Their whole life cycle, like a lot of other butterflies and moths, is really complicated and really quite beautiful. Their migration patterns are just astounding, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Okay. So as adults, they're something that's called generalist pollinators. You've all heard of the term pollinators, right? Pollination. So generalist means what you think. Lots of different kinds of flowers. The monarchs love them. They'll go from one to another, just like other insects. And by, just by eating, just like honeybees do, like ants do, they will drag bits of pollen from one to another and they'll actually fertilize the flowers. It's really cool. So they help the flowers, the flowers help them, and it's a really wonderful symbiotic relationship. The larvae, or the caterpillars, face, eat only one plant. Yeah. Milkweed, you got it. <laughs> got a ringer in the front row. Thank you very much. I'll pay you later. <laughs> so they, um, yeah, the larvae only eat milkweed, and we'll discuss why that's a bit of an issue, and even more and more and more of an issue as time goes on. It's. You know, the, the adults have it pretty easy as far as finding the food that they need. But these guys, one thing, one thing only. Can you imagine if you just had to eat french fries? I mean, really. That's yeah. the only thing you could live on. Hmm. Might be okay for a day or two, but okay. This is what they eat. Hmm. So their life cycle. As an egg, the lay the egg is laid on the underside of a milkweed. So we've got the top of the leaf, like this. Actually, I guess maybe I should stand over here. We've got the top of the milkweed, and the, um, 
the, the adults will go on to the milkweed flower and they'll eat just like they eat any other, you know, eat the nectar at any other flower, but they'll lay their eggs on the underside for protection. And it's interesting because the a female will only lay one egg per plant. And any guesses as to why that is? They can eat the whole thing. Yeah, so they can eat the whole thing. You're a mama, you lay your eggs, you want to make sure that your babies have enough to eat. Mm. So they'll only lay one egg per plant. And they'll also tend to lay, and I didn't know this until just recently, they'll, they'll tend to lay on young plants. So not the, you know, not the big old hardy milkweed. Mm. They'll, lay on, you know, they'll lay on the ones that are only just starting out. Mm. And that's because the younger plants haven't had a chance to attract the things that can eat the monarchs. Mm. Mm. So they, the younger plants don't have as many predators, so they're, they're clean. It's a nice clean habitat for the babies. Mm. What time of year do they lay their eggs? Uh, they lay, once they're in the area where they are going to lay, uh, generally it's spring, summer, fall. Pardon me? They just don't do it at the beginning, they do it all summer. All summer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. This, for reference, is a pin. So monarch eggs are very, very tiny. And that's a close-up of a monarch egg. They're actually not quite beautiful. And there's some back there. <laughs> and there's a little challenge back there because there are three separate pieces of paper with a milkweed on it. And <clears throat> you'll have to guess which ones are actual eggs. <laughs> Okay, so after three to ten days, the larva ha or the uh, the egg hatches and becomes that beautiful, beautiful, non-hairy larva, hmm. and it's got these great antennas and they're very expressive. If they get jostled or or, or upset, they'll actually start to wiggle their antenna. Like, hmm. Get away! Get away! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they go from this size to the larva. And the larva get to be about yay long, mm. maybe an inch and a half, mm. inch and a half or so, uh, in only 10 to 14 days. So can you imagine the rate of growth from that mm. to that mm. in two weeks at the most? Mm. So. After, whoops, battery's low. Mm -hmm. It's plugged in, so that should be Oh, we need it. Pardon me. Is, is that on? Turn it on. I don't want to turn it. Chris. <coughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's on. That's the computer's not plugged in. Oh, the computer. Oh, OK. Thanks, Bonnie. Did you get it? No, uh, the computer needs to be plugged computer in. Computer needs to be plugged in. Okay, so while Bonnie's doing that. Uh, so after 10 to 14 days, when the larva is fully grown, it forms a chrysalis. Uh, and there are chrysalis back there for you to look at as well. Uh, they actually, this is a, kind of a crummy picture, they actually are incredibly beautiful. They're the pale green color They've got gold dots all along one ridge, gold and black dots, and little gold dots periodically. Um, they're very smooth. They look like a piece of jewelry or a crazy gemstone for another planet. So, from larva to chrysalis, 10 to 14 days, and this comes out, the adult. Hmm. And the adults generally live between two to five weeks. So it's not a very long time. And at the end of two weeks, at the end of three, four, five weeks, female, find male, lay eggs. Hmm. So that's, that's their life cycle. It's not a very long life cycle in general. And we'll go back to the in general in a minute. So, Barbara to chrysalis. We'll make a little silk pad on a branch, a twig. Um, interestingly enough, 
because I hadn't enclosed my uh, my little guys sufficiently. <laughs> there are little chrysalises, chrysali, hanging <laughs> hanging all over Gina's room, hanging from her curtain, from her windowsill, and this was the most portable, <laughs> hanging from the or from the female deer, <laughs> which looks rather like a goat's beard or a turkey beard or something like that. <laughs> so they're wonderful escape artists if you decide to try to keep them yourself. Anyway, okay, so it'll it'll make a uh, silk pad on the underside for protection again, and then what it does is it hooks an appendage into that silk pad and just kind of squiggles it in upside down. Squiggles it in upside down. And it's called a cremaster or a cremaster that attaches to the pad. And then what it does is it starts to shed its skin. So this is the chrysalis, which is already under the skin. And it starts to shed its skin and it sheds it from the bottom to the top. And then it hangs upside down until the chrysalis emerges. You wow. see there the, uh, the shed skin is just up at the top. And I have several shed skins back there for you to look at as well. It kind of looks like something from another planet. <laughs> look at them closely. <laughs> okay. So from chrysalis to butterfly. I have a question. How yes. long does it take for them to do that? No, when they're shrinking like that, making the chrysalis, how long does that take? You know what? I've never actually seen it happen. <clears throat> and I, I saw a, forgot a, a look video of one and it made it look like it happened like <coughs> an hour or something, or like a few minutes, but I can't imagine it would take only a few minutes. No, I'm sure. I'm, I it doubt that it's a few minutes. Yes? I had one go to a chrysalis in my kitchen. Uh huh. And it was hanging upside down. And I had to run out to pick up my mother. I was gone an hour. When I came back, I had a crystal. Hmm. Under so, an hour. So somewhere <laughs> in an hour, because I thought, oh, I'll have plenty of time to look at this when I get back. When I came back, it was done. Ah, so yes. So I can tell you, it's somewhere in an hour. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> OK, so we have an under the hour. <laughs> I would, I would uh, suggest that anybody, if you have questions that I can't answer, and I'm certainly not an expert on all things monarch. I know some things about them. As an environmental educator, you learn a little bit about a lot of things, but sort of like a generalist contractor, as opposed to you know a cabinet maker. You know? mm -hmm. They can do lots of, lots of broad things, but maybe not quite so much the, the specific things. Okay, so uh, if you remember what a chrysalis looks like, it doesn't look like this, right? When they're getting ready, when they're getting close to the time when the butterfly is going to emerge, they actually turn black. And you can, they become trans, translucent and then they become transparent. And you can actually see the butterfly in there. And then they will pull themselves out. The chrysalis splits. They pull themselves out. They start to unfurl their wings. They eat it. And then they need to hang upside down for two hours. Hmm. And why would that be? Drying out. That's right, drying out. Hmm. Their wings need to dry out. If they are disturbed at this phase, their wings probably won't form correctly, and it'd be like trying to fly, you know. <laughs> so it's very important if you if you see a monarch that's, that's coming out of a chrysalis, or if you see anything like that coming out of a chrysalis, dragonflies, other things are the same way. Other winged creatures, if they're coming out, they need their wings to just be for a while, to harden, to dry out and harden. Okay. Do they eat the Christmas at all? No, no. no. You'll see. There's some. Uh, there's some some empty chrysalises, chrysalide, back there that you can look at after um, after we talk. So where do they live? They're native to North and South America. 
in the 1800s, probably when we started moving around more, the monarchs started spreading around more. Hmm. In the 1840s, they showed up in Hawaii, and as you can imagine, they're probably pretty happy there. <coughs> it's warm, there's lots of flowers. In the 1850s through the 70s, they spread all over the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand. And there's also population around Portugal and southern Spain. So they're pretty widespread now. In their North American range, they're limited by what most things are limited by, what you and I are limited by. Where can they get their food that they need at the various stages of their life? They obviously need water, just like we do. They're also, because they don't have nice warm houses with wood stoves like we have here in Vermont, they're limited by temperature. So whereas the monarchs in Hawaii, the ones that live there now, are just happy and happy-go-lucky all year round, a lot of the monarchs need to move. So when and why do they migrate? They migrate south in the fall hmm. or earlier. Depends on the October-ish. But as we know, because we've lived more than a year, especially here in Vermont, every fall is different. Sometimes it gets cold really early. Sometimes it just stays summer seemingly forever. They have to migrate because they can't survive the cold winter temperatures. They just can't. A lot of creatures can, but they're just not built for it. And also, their food becomes unavailable. <coughs> and so they migrate south in the fall, migrate back north in the spring, because they need to come back for birthing. They need to be in a place where there's going to be food for their larva, and the food for their larva is only, only, only milkweed. <laughs> okay. So how do they know? How do they know? Is it like somebody goes out and dings a bell, do, 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 all right, righty, come on, let's get to the fly. Let's, let's fly south. So the days gradually become shorter, and the gradually there is important. There have been, there's been at least one study, there's probably more studies, where monarchs are, are kept in a, in a chamber, and they will alternate the day and, and night cycle, simulate day and night. And it's interesting because if they only, only make the days shorter and the nights longer consistently, nothing really happens. It doesn't stimulate any other behavior in the monarchs. But if the days gradually become shorter, if they simulate Ten hour night, and then eleven hour night, and then a twelve, and you know, get longer and longer night times. The monarchs themselves will get a biological cue. Hmm. The temperatures fluctuate more, especially the nighttime. When it gets nighttime, cold temperatures, hmm. as we experience, when we say, "Yay, it's good sleeping weather," the monarchs say, "Ah, oh, might be time to move." Milkweed quality declines. This is a, a milkweed, and if you hunt that, hunt around, I'm sure you'll see some that are like this. Lots and lots of aphids this time of year. Not so much when they when they're first coming up and early, you know, earlier in the summer, even midsummer. So, with the temperatures fluctuating, you know, we start to get cold snaps. Um, the light declining, the milkweed begins to yellow, begins to dehydrate. It's just not really good food for the for the larval monarchs, you know, when they're first hatching out. Uh, and because they're often covered with these um, these aphids, it gets sort of a sooty mold from well, basically uh, aphid excrement. <laughs> okay. So how do they migrate? What happens? 
up to 3,000 miles in 8 to 10 weeks. So they migrate from the northern range in Canada all the way to wherever they're going to go. And the probably the Canada, the Canadian ones probably have the longest migration, that's around 3,000 miles. I checked online, 2,823 miles from the Springfield Library, <laughs> where they, the ones that we released today will probably end up. So, you can, uh, when we release them later, you can give a, give a good cheer for them because they've got a long way to go. <laughs> and they've been known to fly 375 miles at a stretch over water, over 16 hours. It's a long time. Long, long time. So, more about how they migrate. Remember that, uh, remember the, the lifespan of an adult monarch? Isn't it two to five weeks? Can't go that far. These guys, wait, these guys take eight to ten weeks. Hmm. So what happens? The Methuselah generation, hmm. along with the biological cues that tell them that it's time to migrate, the last generation that's grown in the fall lives for several months. I know, isn't it bizarre? It's really cool. <laughs> so they live up to, um, up to several months. They'll fly up to 30 miles per hour, which is pretty fast, mm. considering their flight is sort of mm. all over the place. Mm. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and they've been spotted up to 12,000 feet high. Mm. Generally, they fly closer to the ground, but they can fly pretty high. And they tend to group together. Mm. If you've seen them in and around your yards, you probably don't see them like this. If you do, you're really lucky. Mm. Um, but they tend to be pretty solitary, except when, they're, except when it's time to mate. And then it's only, obviously, two of them coming together. But when it's time to migrate, they all pop, fly together. Mm. It's like Canada geese. They just get more and more and more in their numbers. Mm. And by the time they, um, they get to where they're going, this will look like a little tiny backyard barbecue. <laughs> mm. Okay. So how do they know? How do they figure out where to go? They'll fly southwest using the sun, but they can actually compensate for passing time. Because at 8 a.m., the sun's here, 4 p.m., it's here, and they're still flying generally southwest. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting interesting technique and we're not sure exactly how they compensate for passing time. But scientists are pretty sure that the main compass is the sun. But what do you do if there's no sun? This is really cool. You're going to love this. <laughs> On cloudy days, there's they actually use a UV powered internal compass and it's located in their antenna they have all right let me get back to this the earth's the earth obviously has a mag magnetic field right you all know you all used a compass you know it points to north or true north that's because the magnetic field lines run from the south pole to the north pole mm -hmm. and monarchs can actually sense that and I brought a couple of uh, couple of magnets. Sorry, magnets here for you to uh, for you to check out at some point. Actually, you want to come up here for a second? You look like you like you're interested in things. Let's see. Oh, this is even better. So, can you hold this? 
And do you feel when you get a little bit closer to that? Can you feel something happening? Mm -hmm. What's it do? Yes, it pulls it. And if you have a couple of them, here you go, two hands. Here, why don't you? And you kind of take them and there's a certain way that they don't want to go together. Ah, from the side. Turn one to the side. I like that. Oh, yours are different. Okay. Mm -hmm. you can, but you can feel the force, right? All right, so the monarchs can actually feel that force as well. Thank you for your help, sir. <laughs> the monarchs can feel that as well. And that helps tell them when they're getting off course. And so they use the gradient in the magnetic field from, from the pole to the equator to help guide their way. And interestingly, and this is partly how they found out about it, in a flight simulator, imagine these guys in a flight simulator, you know, B-52 bombers, right? Or monarchs. Uh, scientists changed the magnetic field artificially, and that, rather than changing the light orientation, made them change direction. Hmm. So they really key in on a magnetic field for orientation. Hmm. Hmm. So, what do they need? Where do they go? Warm and sunny, like a lot of snowbirds. Hmm. The monarchs that are west of the Rocky Mountains <coughs> tend to go to California. Mm. And they don't have as, as pronounced a migration because they just don't have as far to go. So they'll go from central-ish to Southern California. Southern California is a little more popular for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, Florida, interestingly, may, interestingly, may be a monarch sink. So sometimes, and we probably know people like this, sometimes the monarchs that happen to wander down to Florida say, oh, not so bad. I think I'll stay here. <laughs> and some of them stay and stop migrating altogether. Generally, most of them, most of them, or at least some of them, will continue on with the, migra you know, with the migration pattern. The biggest one, though, the most important area for monarchs for overwintering is the mountains of Mexico, <laughs> central South Mexico. And we'll talk about that. Viva Mexico! Mm. There is a monarch butterfly biosphere reserve in Sierra Chincua in central Mexico. And it was designated a World Heritage Site in 2008. There are almost 140,000 acres to the reserve. Uh, and eight of 10 of the overwintering monarch colonies in central Mexico are within the boundaries of the reserve. So that's a really good thing for the monarchs. And in fact, it's estimated that about 70% of the eastern monarchs, including ours from Vermont, end up right here, which is pretty cool. Um, it's a very rugged area, very, very rugged area, volcanic mountains, but it suits the monarchs just fine. Wow. So why Mexico? There's a particular tree called the Oyamel fir tree. And yes, those are all monarchs. Oh. Those are all monarchs. All monarchs. That was the tree. I know. So leaves. No, I know. I know. It's mm -hmm. amazing how many there are down there. Uh, there are so many that, you know how in wintertime when we get a heavy snowfall, the fir trees will kind of go all the branches will mm. weighed down. They'll actually get weighed down with monarchs. Wow. wow. And monarchs weigh about as much as a paper clip. <laughs> so that's a lot of paper clips hanging from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because they use the same trees every year. Oh, wow. 
is that female versus male or what do you mean female tree versus male tree or I don't I actually I don't know that I don't know that I just know that they go back to the same trees That's funny. but they're not the same butterflies that were there it's their great grandparents or their great great grandparents that were in the same trees I know it boggles the mind. So what do they do? Well, they literally hang out. That's <laughs> what they do. They fattened up on the way down. They eat, they fly, they eat, they fly, they eat, they fly, they eat. That's what they do. They sleep when they need to sleep, but they eat a lot. Because they don't eat when they're in Mexico. Hmm. Who knows why? The they're not looking for milkweed when they're migrating south because they're just on a mission. They want to get to Mexico. They want to beat the winter. When they decide it's time to fly, it's really time to fly. They're not looking to lay more eggs or make you know make another generation of monarchs. The the, the Methuselah generation really just wants to go. <coughs> Oh, just like uh, just like uh, all of the other adult monarchs, they'll take nectar from flowers. So as they fly south, I mean, I don't know about your garden, but my gardens aren't looking so good this time of year. There's still some things blooming, but there's not a lot for them to eat. There's still something. But as they go further and further south, there's more and more stuff blooming. So they kind of bulk up on the way, and they need to bulk up because they only drink water. <coughs> Every day, those millions of monarchs fly all away from those trees <coughs> and find water, mm -hmm. and they drink. Mm -hmm. So every day, it's this huge fluttering extravaganza mm -hmm. of monarchs. And they all sit there, and they sit. Mm -hmm. But we have a problem. The monarchs... I know a couple people I talked to before we started here today said that they really hadn't seen as many as they remember seeing in years past. And that's true. Um, it's estimated that about a billion monarchs have vanished since around 1990. It's a lot of monarchs. And that's from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. A lie. See, this is just a graph showing. I know you can't see the numbers, so I'll just tell you. This one's 94 to 95. This is 2016 to 2017, and this is millions of butterflies overwintering in Mexico. So I don't know if um, if you guys know about um, how how scientists estimate populations, but they'll generally take an area, a given area say one acre, or half an acre, a quarter acre, or hopefully probably smaller because there are a lot of butterflies in a quarter acre down there. And they'll actually count the butterflies in a, in a small area, and then they'll extrapolate out and figure out how many there are in a larger area. So from a high point here in 96 to 97, of 910 million butterflies, around 146 million. I mean, it does go up and down. I mean, so it's not it's not a straight, drastic, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. But if you know anything about statistics, this line is not a good line. This line is trending down. So, why? Some of the same things that, uh, that threaten, that threaten other, other things. Trees, logging. Even though that's a reserve in Mexico, a reserve is sort of a loose designation. And there's a lot, there's a lot of private inholdings. Um, there's illegal and legal logging. And it's the fir trees that are there. I mean, that's what's being logged. So, loss of habitat from, you know, 
for roads, for houses, for farms. I mean, yes, people need places to live, they need farms to grow food, but the monarchs only need, are only in this relatively small area. So it's, it's becoming a challenge for them. Okay. Another threat in the summer, crops. We grow more and more and more corn and soybeans and cover huge swaths of, of land with, with this one crop. In, uh, in the Midwest, the milkweed is down to only 3% of historic coverage. So female monarchs, if they make their way to areas in the Midwest, they're flying around looking for milkweed, looking for a place to lay their eggs, and aside from a, you know, a couple over there and a couple over there, they just can't find what they need. They can't find places to lay their eggs. <coughs> Herbicides and chemicals. Studies are actually a little bit conflicted about that. You know, my, my knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, yeah, it's the, it's the herbicides and all the chemicals we use and the, you know, the, the herbicide-resistant um, weed killers are that, you know, that we've made our plants into. May or may not be. One thing that we're sure of is that the milkweed is not there. So whether the chemicals have killed the milkweed, and that's why the monarchs aren't doing as well, or whether it's the chemicals themselves that are affecting the monarchs directly, we just don't know. Um, and in fact, this is, mm, I'm, I'm not gonna say that that's an, a firmly established link. I, you know, my, my take is, uh, is typically to err on the side of caution with, uh, you know, with things that become endangered, but that's me. <laughs> so the monarch threats. You know, this looks like a lot of information on it, but it's actually just a couple things I want you to just take a look at. Um, this is the overwintering, it, overwintering uh, area that monarchs use in Mexico. So that's that, that high point, remember around 96, 97? So obviously when the monarch numbers go down, they're using a smaller and smaller area because they just, they tend to cluster very close together. So the area shrinks as their population shrinks. So this is a graph that shows the, how much area they have used. And just like their population, that's a, that line is trending down, even though I would, you know, in 2015 it was actually a good year for them. The reddish or orange is amount of herbicide resistant crops hmm. in, um, in 10 million acres. So lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of herbicide resistant crops, which means you can use the herbicide, you don't have to worry about killing your crops, but you still have a lot of chemicals out there. So monarch numbers have gone down. The area that monarchs are using for overwintering in Mexico have gone down as this has gone up. And it's not consistent. You can see that there are you know, little jumps here and there, but statistics and, and population statistics in particular are about long-term trends. So this trend is not good for the monarchs. It's not the only threat, though. Early freezes and storms. I'm sure you can all remember those early freak storms. Like, wait a minute. There's still leaves on the trees. I still have stuff in the garden. And there's two inches of snow on the ground. Hmm. That's not good for the monarchs. Uh, changing weather patterns from global warming. This is an interesting one. If monarchs, because of rising temperatures, decide that it's time to start migrating north before the milkweed becomes established, 
not so much there's nothing to eat for them, there's nothing to eat, there's no place to lay their eggs, and there's nothing for the larval monarchs to eat. So that, that is something that, that scientists are going to have to keep an eye on and see how that is, is affecting monarchs. They have such things to not eat flowers. Well, there you go. Oh. You could be a milkweed farm. Mm. You could be a milkweed farmer. Mm. So some of the things you can do are really easy. Play milkweed. There's a big black tub in the back. And I just happened to pick a bunch of milkweed pods on the way here. <laughs> so feel free to take one or a couple on your way out. Let the pod dry out all the way like this and then take out the seeds and put them someplace where you don't mind giving a little corner of your yard or corner of a field to milkweed mm -hmm. and then just let them be. We should do that long. Pardon me? I'll say we should do that long. Oh, I'm keeping one. <laughs> there you go. Now there are milkweed farmers who grow the milkweed for fiber. Okay. Do you know if they cut that down before the monarchs or whoever use it or do they cut it down during if they I don't know specifically but that, you know what I'm not I'm not gonna hazard a guess on that I was because I, I don't know, know. I read that they're trying to get milkweed farmers for fibers and I just wondering when they harvest it was after um, I I would guess I would guess that they would, if they're harvesting it for fiber, that they would want it to get as big as it could be. But that's just a guess. And that would be this time of year. But again, that's just a guess. I don't know. Where does milkweed grow the best? Everywhere or full well, size? Most, mostly it's like in fields. Um, Lori and I went to a field where we live. And there's like bunches of milkweeds. And we just like found like Caterpillars and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where were the fields around here? Oh um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah there are mil yeah. There's milkweed. There's milkweed all over yeah. the areas. Remember, we um, we looked at the the North American range for milkweed or yeah. for monarchs. Mm -hmm. Where monarchs are as adults, except for over their overwintering area, milkweed grows because that's what they need. That's the only plant that they'll lay their eggs on because that's the only thing that the larval caterpillar yeah, pillars will eat. But I think she meant, does it grow in the sun? Does it grow? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, down yes. No the good does it grow? Uh, so shade. full sun would be like the best place? Yeah, it's yeah. the best place. But, you know, if if you start looking around, you'll see it, you know, there's a little patch on the side of the road. I've seen it that much. I wouldn't know how to identify it. That's why. They don't have a for nothing. That's no beach. Okay. That's no big. And some of it's, you know, some of it's only yay big. Some of it's yay big. Some, of some have, yeah, some, a lot of it's getting yellowed because we've had, you know, cold snaps. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's all it flowers, it's over too, if you look at it. Yes, it does flower. It does yeah. have flowers on the top. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, not now, but yes, it does. Are they really purple or blue? Purple. 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 Yeah, it's, it's not a very... Mm. It's not okay. really in flower. Lilac purple. Almost right. looks like a lilac right. individual flower. Right. Yeah. Um, um, stem you could also just plant more flowers. Give them give the adult monarch something to eat. Mm -hmm. I mean they'll they'll be fine going for uh, going for uh, wildflowers, but if you want them around your garden, they're beautiful. And plant some milkweed somewhere else in your in your area to give them some place to lay their eggs. Yes, sir? We had, uh, we used to live up on Baker Road and had about four acres, and we let the back acre away from the road just go. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to save uh, gasoline for the lawnmower, for one thing. <laughs> and I wanted to allow wildflowers to just be wildflowers out there. and. Uh, that's one of the places that I saw monarchs. Unfortunately for uh, 
Unfortunately, one of the places the milkweed seemed to thrive was in our perennial garden, where it wasn't necessarily <laughs> the most welcome. Uh -huh. but, uh, it was around. There was milkweed around, but there were also goldenrods, and they, they loved to, to eat goldenrod. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Eat, eat goldenrod yeah. nectar. When the oh, absolutely. Yeah. There, you know, the adults will, will go where the nectar is. So if you have, you know, if you want them around your yard, you know, I have a have one of those gardens where you always have stuff blooming. And like I said, if you can just designate a little corner of your yard or, you know, an unused part of a field to monarchs by scattering some milkweed seeds, that's a good thing. Donate to groups. I'm not going to pick you up for money for groups, but you know, if you're so inclined, check out various groups online. Um, I know that the uh, the sanctuary in Mexico is trying to expand the area that is at least nominally covered and nominally protects the overwintering monarchs. So that's a, you know that's one of the organizations. The organizations that study and track monarch and mon monarch populations, those are good. But you know, you can decide on that yourself. Just learn more and talk to other people. You know, that's that's a big thing too. You know, if you see a farmer's field that's got one little corner, only one corner that's got milkweed in it, which actually just happened to us, um, it got hay. It got mowed down for hay. And um, one of the reasons that I don't have any larval monarchs is probably because the field just got hayed. <laughs> and so there were only you know a few straggly plants right along the edge. And so, you know, if you have a field like that, you could just decide, like this gentleman did, I'm just gonna let that that go. I'm gonna designate that wild habitat. The people who bought our house decided to keep letting it go, so that was good too. Ah, very nice. <laughs> they also didn't want to mow. They <laughs> also didn't want to mow, and they also, I think, had a certain conservationist flavor about it. Ah, oh, beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Remember that anytime you leave these wildflowers, um, the milkweed, goldenrod, asters, etc., you're not only helping the monarchs, you're helping all kinds of other. Uh, critters, the bees, and all kinds of other butterflies and birds. Um, I had routinely mowed our back 40 uh, in early November, and I have also discovered that when I don't mow it then, the birds are eating the seeds all winter. So I'm thinking, geez, maybe I need to mow in early April. <laughs> of course, you need to mow it once in a while to keep it from growing up the trees, but that's been my condition. We even let it do that. On yep. We even let it grow off the trees on purpose. Well, yes, I I know about that too. <laughs> but but just remember all the different critters that you're supporting. Mm -hmm. It isn't just the monarch butterflies. The bees love the asters and the goldenrod and and uh, now we have the not just the the um, dull or softer colored asters with the very bright purples and pinks are becoming more and more prolific. Oh, yeah, and they're gorgeous. The bees love them, mm -hmm. and what few butterflies are around. Right. So if you can put off mowing of some areas, and it's really, it's gorgeous. It's much more interesting than a lawn. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And, you, and you save the energy of not mowing. Oh, yeah. Them. There are even deer beds in that field. In the second and third years, oh, yeah. after it began to grow up as a tree. Well, that, that's one of the things about um, about conservation biology. Um, often there will be what's called a charismatic creature. You know, wolves, for instance, monarchs, for instance, polar bears. And if you get if you can get people interested in helping along or conserving or just being interested in that charismatic creature, often, as you said, a lot of other creatures that are maybe not quite so beautiful, quite so cute, quite so whatever, are helped along the way. So if you if you provide habitat for one, you're helping numerous others. We have friends that they they mow, but they do part of their field one year, and then they do the other part the next ah, year. Ah, good. 
It's a great practice. Yeah, another trick I heard was it was good to do a little bit of mowing even in June to allow younger um, milkweeds to come along. So, and I noticed that we didn't mow some until July, and now we, you know, we have the younger milkweed that you're talking about mm -hmm. that has come along. It's not just the old guys. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have a section that's just milky, but I go in there in November with the brush hog. Yeah. And as much as that sounds horrible, when the brush hog hits those pods, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a giant spreader for milky. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of actually not a bad thing because it takes everything down and it just really uh -huh. adds it everywhere. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got some pictures to give you here. Oh, great. They're, um, they're uh, caterpillars up in Benson, Vermont, at the Mercy Echo Farm, Sisters of Mercy Echo Farm. And I got, there's another beetle that eats milkweed and also identifies itself with an orange stripe. So you know not to eat it <laughs> oh, I've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> It's the milkweed that makes them toxic. I don't think mm -hmm. you mentioned Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't say that. It is the milkweed that makes them toxic and also makes these babies toxic. So mm -hmm. I'll leave these pictures with you if people will like them. Uh, there's, the, there's the challenge of working without notes. You forget little tidbits that you wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I remember hearing that um, they found like this holy grail where they all hung out and the magnificent storm like almost decimated them. Mm -hmm. But was that Mexico or was it a special island and I where in that think downfall did that happen and they recouped? I think I that know. was Mexico. I think I remember hearing that. I think that was Mexico. I won't swear to it, but I think it was there. I think it was too. So it was like just one season and then they you know, bounced back or I don't know. Well, because it went up and down. Like yes, and like yeah, it did. Was, right, right. It did go up and down, and, down, and it's down. right. So it's not just freak winter storms here or freak early storms here. It can, you know, you can get odd weather down there. Right. I mean, you can get all sorts of things that you know will pummel them, and you know the <coughs> populations for for everything except for humans usually, you know, has cycles. And it, they're not always even because of things like that. You know, sometimes everything will be going along swimmingly and you'll have millions of your brethren and then you'll get a freak storm and a huge die off. Uh, but generally speaking, over time, the population can rebuild as long as there is enough of a, of a starting population. To, uh, to start rebuilding. Do the same ones that fly down there fly back? Yes. Um, they fly back to a certain point. But it, as you might imagine, you know, if they normally live only two to, it was two to five weeks, these guys have lived months already. They haven't eaten. So mm -hmm. they're down there in Mexico and they just, they're, they're living on water and mud, I guess. <laughs> from you know, snuggling up with their, their weather sister monarchs. And then they have to start flying back. So they're kind of tired and exhausted. They don't all make it. Well, I'm sure they don't all make it, but enough make it back to where the milkweed is growing that they then have their first generation. And then those will hatch out and fly further, and then those will hatch out and fly further. Mm. Huh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so the, you know, it's really only the, that last, or uh, Methuselah generation, that, that has the great challenge. I mean, the others are all pretty cool, and they're beautiful and all that, but you know, they have like little hopping, hopping skips to migrate, uh, but the Methuselah generation is the one that's, you know, is like the big winner <laughs> for migration. Well, this has just been fascinating to to me, and I can tell to you too. Can they look? Oh yes, yeah, please. I have. We have back there some live monarchs. That uh, there's two at least that have hatched out. One just hatched out uh, a couple hours before I came here. So um, they are both ready to be let go. So we'll uh, we'll do that as we're leaving. 
Um, there are some shed skins back there. There's a chrysalis that fell off on its own, which is the only reason that it's out and about. There's a chrysalis um, shell, if wow. you will. Um, uh, and again, those three monarch or three leaves that have what may or may not be monarch eggs. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to decide for yourself. <coughs> so feel free to take a look. Take a, take a milkweed pod on your way out, and I'll be around for questions if you're interested. And uh, there's a, we put some library books there if you would like to check any of those out. Ah, oh, yes, because we're a library. That's right. Yay! Yay. Well, thank you very much, Larry. This is wonderful. A little less anxious. So the way that you do it is you put your put your finger in. Mind if I just guide you? Yeah. All right. And, and let him. If you can put your finger like right in, in front and a little bit underneath, and let him crawl on. Okay. Is he doing that? Yep. There yep. you go. I don't want to go. Yeah. Alright. Yeah. It is a little cold. Tickets. Yep. Yep. 